This program is made possible by the members of the Church Street Baptist Church in Greensboro, North Carolina. Coming up this week on Unspeakable Joy with Pastor Tyler Galden. I'll tell you what you do. You get yourself an old-fashioned Holy Ghost ghost of God Almighty and say, God, give me power to speak the truth right here as they're sitting in that chair, as they're at your desk. You say, I know you got problems. I know you got issues. I know you got sin running rampant in your life. But let me tell you about the great God of eternity. That'll change your life and will take hell out and put heaven in. Honey, get God in your soul. I'm begging you, just stay. We want to invite you to the Piedmont Jubilee here at Church Street Baptist Church beginning Sunday morning, July the 30th, running through August the 3rd, Thursday night. Each night we'll have a different preacher and choir ending on the Thursday night with Dr. Ralph Sexton Jr. preaching on prophecy. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday we'll have a special time called Camp Jubilee for our children. We want to invite you. A time where God moves, the people are encouraged, and Jesus is exalted. Join us for this year at the Piedmont Jubilee. Paul, he is the apostle. Timothy is the apprentice. And Ephesus is the assignment. It's interesting to me as I look there at that little phrase, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. Basically what that means in the English, if we could get the weight of that message, it says, Timothy, look son, I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. I am absolutely laying down at your feet and I'm asking you, son, please, I need you to stay at Ephesus. I need you to abide there. There is something that I need you to do. Now, I believe the reason that Paul uses that phrase, I besought thee, it literally means to get down on your hands and knees and beg somebody. And ladies and gentlemen, tonight I do not know about you, but honey, if somebody is begging me to do something, that is a weight. Now I'll tell you tonight, if Brother Bob said, uh, Brother Tyler, I need you to do this, I'd probably, you know, let it go in, I'd let it ponder, and I'd probably do this. But if Brother Bob got tonight down on his hands and knees and said, Brother Tyler, I've got to have you do this, it would make me step back and I would say, what is it that you need me to do? Why? Is that so important that you're wanting me to stay? Now, you've got to understand, Brother Paul here loves this young man, Timothy. In fact, in verse number 2, he calls him mine own son. He gives to him a term of endearment. And it would be as if you said to your own boy, Son, I need you to stay there because I've got to go do something else. Now, the love that you have for your son is no less any way that you do it. But there is something so important about the assignment that Paul says to Timothy, my boy, please, I'm begging with you. I'm pleading with you. I need you to stay where you are at. And tonight, as I look at that, as I ponder that, I tell you tonight, there may be somebody in here that is fixing to quit. There may be somebody in here that is fixing to throw in the towel. 
There may be somebody in here tonight that is just about to say to foot with the whole thing. I may as well just stay at home, watch it on the internet, or just catch the fishing show or the hunting show or the baseball game. There may be somebody in here tonight and you may be saying, you know what, I think I'm just going to back off just a little bit. I think I'm going to step back just a little bit. There may be somebody in here tonight that says, is it really worth the price that I'm having to pay? But I say to you tonight, as the Holy Spirit is beckoning in my heart, I beseech thee that you abide still at Ephesus. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight there is an assignment that God has placed down in every one of our hearts. Do you realize tonight that you could have been born in Moscow? Do you realize tonight that you could have been born and stayed in Washington, D.C.? This morning there was a lovely couple sitting over to my left, right about where Brother Martin is sitting. And he was sitting here, they were sitting here at the door. I was shaking hands and I, I like to talk to people. So I just looked at him and I said, folks, where are you from? They said, we are from Burma. I said, Burma, what are you doing all the way in North Carolina? What are you doing here? They said, I don't know. I guess God just wanted us here. Here's what I have to say about that. That may be a funny little answer, but it is stacked full of truth. Do you realize tonight the fact that God has us in this place, the fact that God has us in this church, the fact that God has us in this city, the fact that God has you in whatever capacity. Do you realize that the fact that you're in the marriage that you're in, the fact that you have the children that you have, the fact that you're in the school that you're in, the job that you're in, it is that God has an assignment for you in that location. Here is my question tonight. Why should you abide where you are? Why is is it you should not throw in the towel on what you're doing? Why is it tonight that God has placed you where He has placed you? I want to give you three little points tonight. Lay them out. Put them in my shotgun gospel shooter and lay them out there for you and see what the Holy Spirit does in your heart. Number one, Paul said, I beseech thee that you abide still at Ephesus. Number one, because of the potential of the city. Look at verse number 3. Paul says this, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. Ephesus was the fourth largest, most prominent city in all of the Roman Empire. It was the largest city in all of Asia proper. It was the largest city. It was above Galatia. It was above Philippi. It was above Colossae. It was above Thessalonica. It was above absolutely every city. This city sat on a major thoroughfare, a major roadway, or a major crossway in the Roman Empire. Why did Paul say, now boy, I want you to stay in Ephesus? There were two reasons. Number one, because in Ephesus there were many souls. God has placed us right in the heart of Guilford County, North Carolina. You say, preacher, what is so big about that? I'll tell you what's so big about that. Greensboro, North Carolina is the third largest city in North Carolina. Charlotte is the largest, and then, and then uh, Raleigh is the next largest, and Greensboro is the third largest. Do you realize that within the city walls of Greensboro there are over 283,000 souls that are in our reach. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight in Guilford County proper there are almost 600 thousand people that are within just a few miles of our church wall. Do you know why God has placed us here tonight? Do you know why God has put us in this city? Because that is, there are 500,000 souls. There are 500 set, 500,000 sets of eyeballs, 500 sets of ear. There are 500 sets of nostrils, 500 sets of hands, 500,000 sets of feet. But more than that, more than the eyes, the ears, the nose, and all of that, God sees there are 500,000 hearts that are on their way to a devil's hell if a group of men, women, boys, and girls do not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, do I tell you tonight that God has not put a four-walled church on the side of Church Street so that we can have a magnificent building, so that we can have golden faucets and dog houses with air conditioners. He's placed us in this city because we have a message of hope and we have a message of grace and we have a message of power and we have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ. Our songs have the songs of life. Our message has the message of life. Our way has the way of life. Our heart has the heartbeat of life. Our mind has the mind thought of life. Everything that we do has life.
life from the time that we get up to the time that we go to bed and God has thought so much of you that he said, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you to abide still in Guilford County. I'm pleading with you, abide in Guilford. Listen, how many times, be honest with me, don't lie to me, I won't lie to you. Have you said, you know what, on this, I'm out. Okay, me and Lynn, the only honest people in Dennis in this whole church. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, I know I make you mad and you make me mad. Everybody, everybody makes everybody mad. You with me? Who's everybody? You hang around the hood long enough, you'll know who an everybody is. You ain't been on Cone Boulevard long enough. You go down to Walmart, you'll know who everybody is. All right, stay with me right now. Here's what I say. Every now and again, I feel like quitting. Every now and again, you feel like quitting. Every now and again, you make me mad, and every now and again, I make you mad. Every now and again, I run out of this, and every now and again, you run out of this. But do you know why we don't stop? Do you know why we're here on Sunday night, a Sunday night on Father's Day? It's because there are people outside those walls that need the message that we have. There's people out there that need to know what we know, need to have what we have, need the hope that we have. And God has placed us here and said, do not quit. Do not throw in the towel. Do not go aside because there are too many souls in this city. Number two, there's a lot of souls, but number two, there's a lot of sin. Ephesus was one of the most godless cities in all of the Roman Empire. You say, preacher, what are we supposed to be doing? I'll tell you what we're supposed to be doing. I know that that bothers you. Never get comfortable around that. But you don't forget the reason God has you on this earth and has not taken you to heaven is because you've been called to be salt. You've been called to be light. I'll tell you ladies that deal with other ladies, whether you cut hair, whether you're a secretary, whether you're the president of the entire company, when other ladies come into your office, other people come into your office, and they're telling you how sorry this is, how messed up that is, I'll tell you what you do. You get yourself an old fashion holy dose ghost of God Almighty and say God give me power to speak the truth right here as they're sitting in that chair as they're at your desk you say I know you got problems I know you got issues I know you got sin running rampant in your life but let me tell you about the great God of eternity that'll change your life and will take hell out and put heaven in honey get God in your soul I'm begging you just stay stay I beg you Timothy don't leave son Why? Because of the potential in the city. I heard C.H. Spurgeon last night preaching. I was reading one of his messages and he made this statement. He said, how many of you before you go to bed at night will get on your knees and say, God, go into my city and take as many souls out of the city as you possibly can. I got so full of that this morning in my soul as I take my morning Sunday drive before I go home and get ready. I drove around this city. I said, great God in heaven, if there's 583,700 people in Guilford County, I pray you'd at least get a tithe off of it and take at least 50,000 souls in my lifetime out of this city. I say if there's a million people in this city, let's give them the gospel. If there's a hundred million people in this city, let's give them the gospel. Do not abandon your post. There's way too much potential in this city. Let's go to number two, the second point. Why did Paul tell Timothy to stay? Because of the potential of the city. Number two, because of the passion of the church. Look there, if you will, in verse number three. Paul said, and I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia. Watch this phrase. That thou mightest charge, how many? Some, but they teach no other doctrine. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul looked at Timothy. I believe Timothy said, but Paul, nobody wants to come to church. Paul, nobody comes back to church. Nobody wants to hear this gospel. And Paul said, now son, I begged you to abide still at Ephesus, and I'm begging you to teach some that they'll teach no other doctrine. Can I tell you tonight, I wish with all of my heart that I could get all. I wish with all of my heart I could get everybody. I wish with all of my heart they would all stay in heed. I wish with all of my heart they would all do right. But tonight, may I tell you, I am more encouraged because I stopped trying to look at the all that won't do everything I want and I look at the some who will do everything that God wants. Tonight, we need to take our focus back on the way that God wants it. And Paul said, there may not be everybody in the church that wants the gospel. There may not be everybody in the church that wants the pure word. There may not be everybody in the church. You may not get all the teenagers. You may not get all the married couples. You may not get all the singles and all the widowers and all the people, but there will be some, so stay behind. If you don't stay behind for everybody, stay behind for some. 
Dr. Percy Ray was the pastor at the Myrtle Baptist Church in Myrtle, Mississippi, where I go down twice a year, normally sometimes three times a year, and I go down there, and that's where I pray. There in this little shotgun church, how many of you old-timers remember the old shotgun churches had, had two sets of pews, about five pews on each side, wood ceilings, wood walls, wood floors. And in there, he would preach. He would preach every morning, preach every night, and nobody would move. They got mad at him. They tried to turn on him. They tried to leave. They tried to go this way, and they tried to go that way. Finally, one Sunday night, Brother Ray got up, and he stood up before the people. He said, folks, tonight I'm telling you this is my last service. This is my last message. I am leaving. I resign at your pastor. There's people you don't like me, and I understand that. I've made many mistakes. I'm telling you tonight you no longer have to deal with me. You no longer have to put up with me. I am turning in my resignation. I'm putting up my Bible. And throwing in my papers. He got down to walk off of the stage. He went to the side door over here. And before he got to the side door, at the door, there was a little lady. And the little lady stood there by the door. You read this in his autobiography. He stood there by the door. As he's walking, he said, ma'am, would you please move out of the way? She said, preacher, I can't move out of the way. He said, but ma'am, you've got to. People don't want me. People don't want me to stay. People don't want me to preach. People don't want me to pray. She stood there by the door and she said, said, I know that they don't, but would you stay for just one? Would you stay for just one soul? He said, I guess I would stay for just one soul. She said, then preacher, would you stay for me? Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, I know there may not be everybody that was here all the time, but there are enough people in this house tonight that love God and love the teaching of the Word of God and love the songs of Zion. I say, great God in heaven, you don't throw in the towel because there's too many people in the church of Jesus Christ that want the good Word of God and want the milk and meat of the word and want the songs of Zion and want the songs of the faith you don't throw in, you don't turn aside ladies and gentlemen, teach the pure word teach the holy word, there will be enough people that will come along, it may not be all, but it will be some it will be some now I got three little things, let me put them right here I just want to show you something, you know what will happen whenever you give the pure word, whenever you teach no other doctrine and give that word to some, number one, it will cause the people to love Do you remember in Revelation chapter 2, John writes to the church at Ephesus and he makes this statement to them. He says, but I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Those people at some point, some time, really loved God. Do you know why? Because they left the first love. Here's my question. What took them from love to leaving their first love? Simple. They got away from doctrine. When you get away from the word, it will cause you slowly to fade. Ladies and gentlemen, you know me. I'm a happy preacher. I don't get up. I don't mouth people. I don't get mad at anybody. I don't tell people this and tell people that. I try to be and stay clean with that book. But do you know why that the love of many are waxing cold in the last day? It is because in the modern day church, in the liberal church, the contemporary church, whatever church you want to say, there is, an, there is a vacancy and there is an absence of the doctrine of Jesus Christ that is being taught in those churches. And that's why people may show up on a Sunday, but you will never find them throughout the week. They don't love God. They don't love the ways of God. How do you know they don't love God? Jesus said this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And people cannot live like the devil and love the God of glory. But I'll tell you tonight, when I get up here and I preach, I know I say crazy things. I know I say uh, stupid jokes. Some lady the other night, I told a joke in Revival the other night. I said this, I said, boy, I love to sing in the shower, but I swallowed some shampoo and it became a soap opera. Say amen right there. I mean, I thought it was a funny joke. I thought it was good. I, I mean, I chuckled. I laughed. One of the ladies on the back row, she said, oh, brother. I mean, this church is a small little church. And I thought, man, what was wrong with that joke? I know I say crazy jokes. I know I say some foolish things, but I'll tell you, you know what happens whenever Tyler or whoever it is, Jack, Bill, uh, Bob, whoever it is, gets up here and opens up this book and says, take the word of God and turn to chapter number so and so. And they get up and they preach that holy word. They preach that powerful word. They preach that true word. They preach that wonderful word. They preach that matchless word. They preach that that, uh, inspired word. They preach that preserved word. I'll tell you what it does to the child of God. It plants a seed, so down 
deep inside like a Valentine's Day card to your soul. It's like God just saying, Mwah, I sure do love you. Mwah, I sure do love you. Mwah, I sure do love you. And when Jesus starts to kiss it on you and loving on you, it turns something over on the inside of you. Said Jesus, if you can love me, I just want you to know, great God in heaven, I love you too. I tell you, brothers and sisters, don't get away from the holy word of God. It'll cause you to love. It'll cause you to listen. So number three, it'll make you last. It'll make you last. Now, let me go to my third point because this is where I need to get to tonight. And I'm done. I mean, I'm really done. I'm getting ready to close my, I'm closing my Bible. I'm done after I read the verse. Here it says in verse number four, Paul says, Timothy, will you stay? Because of the potential of the city, number two, will you please stay because of the passion of the church? Number three, will you please stay because of the poison of the cults? Number, verse number four, Paul says this, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying. So do. Do you know why Paul wanted Timothy to stay? Because there were so many false doctrines that were coming into the church. And Paul said, Timothy, I need you to stay there because if these people eat this poison, it'll kill them. Do you realize that a sheep can only eat one thing, grass. It can't eat flowers. It can't eat bright. Goats can eat anything. Do you know that? Somebody told me the other week that a goat will actually eat a tin can. My wife asked me on the way home from church, she said, Honey, how come a lot of these, 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 these mega monster contemporary churches just... just preaches crazy stuff, and people flock to it. I said, because goats will eat anything. A goat will eat anything. But do you know a sheep? That's why some of you have been in other churches, and you can't take it. You can't take it. It doesn't mean you're not spiritual. It means you are spiritual, and you're a sheep. If you put a tin can in front of a sheep, it'll run from it. It's scared of it. You put a sheep, though, by something that resembles grass, it'll eat it. And you know what will happen to that sheep? It'll get sick. That's what false doctrine and the words of the cults do. That's what Mormonism does. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses do. That's what Catholicism does. That's what all these different cults. And there's a new cult that's arising. It's called the Prosperity Gospel Cult. It says if you'll follow the word of God, God will bless you so much you'll have all the money you want. You'll never get sick. That's a cult. Because there's two Two characteristics of a cult. Number one, it's anything that adds to the Word of God. That's a cult. And number two, whenever you have a leader that you can't do without, that's a cult. The prosperity gospel has leaders of it. There's people like Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen, and T.D. Jakes, and Creflo Dollar. Here's the problem with prosperity gospel and false doctrine. If you eat it, like a sheep, you eat it and you can't figure out why you're not getting strong and you can't figure out why you're staying sick. It's confusing. It'll mess you up. Can I tell you something? Whenever someone takes the Bible and gives it to you alone, and whenever the church goes on when that man dies, the church is bigger the church is greater, the church is stronger, and that's how you know it's the true church. That's how you know. Do you know what false doctrine will do to you? I wrote down three things. Write them down very quickly. Number one, false doctrine will confuse you. Will you look in verse number four? The Bible says, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Watch this phrase, which minister what? Questions. Do you know the difference between false doctrine and truth? Truth always leads you to answers. False doctrine always leads you to confusion. Watch this. Truth, you'll end up saying this, I don't understand it, but I believe it. How many of you believe in electricity? I'm going to be frank with you. I can't describe electricity. I have no idea how it comes that in a plant somewhere that, now look, I know that steam makes this and it turns this turbine, but I don't understand how it works. I'm going to tell you, how many of you believe in nuclear bombs? How many of you 
can understand how they work. I don't know. All I know is fission or fusion pumps it in or blows it out, and it makes a boom. But do you know what? I don't understand it, but I believe it. That's truth. Do you know what the gospel is? I do not understand how can Jesus take a black heart, wash it in red blood, bring it up white as snow. I have no idea, but I believe it. How can God take an old country bumpkin from the backside of McLeansville, shake hell out of him, put heaven in him, and make him a pastor of a church? I have no idea, but I believe it. How can God take a ragtag group of people like us and use them to change and shape the course of an entire city? I don't understand it, but I believe it. Do you know why? Because it's true. Do you know what false doctrine will do? It will give you answers, but it will leave you confused. It's reversed. Watch this. Prosperity gospel. If you give to me and my church and my seed, you'll be blessed. That's an answer, isn't it? But how many of you know it don't always work that way? You do it, but it always leaves you confused. But, but Bob, I gave my money. I sowed my seed. Why am I not getting blessed? I'll tell you why. It's false doctrine. It's a spiritual Ponzi scheme. That's why Mormonism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, they say these things, do this and you'll get this, and you do this and you don't get this. That's a cult. That's confusion and false doctrine. The second thing cults and false doctrine will do, number one, it will confuse you. Number two, it will conceit you. It will puff you up. Look there, if you will, in verse number four. It says, which minister questions rather than what? Godly edifying. Do you know what godly edifying is? It is the tearing down of the outer man so that the inner man can be built up. Do you know what false doctrine does? It tries to build you up from the outside in. Real doctrine builds you up from the inside out. Ladies and gentlemen, anything that tells you feel good about who you are, that's false doctrine. But anything that tells you Feel good about what Jesus is doing in you and through you and by you, great God in heaven. I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. I don't even know why God looks my way. But every day when I wake up, I'm excited that Jesus loves me. I'm excited that he saved me. I'm excited that he's not going to throw in the towel on me. You know what that is? That is godly edifying. That's why every now and again, God will come by and sometimes he uses people. And he'll say, whoa, Hoss, we need to work on that. And it tears you down, but all of a sudden, if I listen, I get built up. That's godly edifying. The third thing that false doctrine will do, it'll confuse you, it'll conceit you. Number three, it will chill you. Look there at the last two words. What are they? So do. Do you know what real doctrine will do? It'll set you on fire for God. I want to say something to you tonight as your pastor. Anything that cools your zeal for God is an idol. You need to get rid of it. If you have found a set of scripture or teachings and it makes you cold on God, you need to throw it out. Anything that steals your zeal for God and His Word and His ways is an idol and heresy. That's why I have a problem with much of the modern day teaching. Anything that sets you on fire for God is a word from a holy God. Brothers and sisters, tonight, I can't leave. I can't throw in the towel. I'm not leaving the city. Until God calls me home or calls me out, He said, Son, Son, Son,